So uh, this morning we're going to be going into part three of the hope of immortality. All true morality is based upon the hope of immortality. What, what are our notions of right and wrong but an evidence of our belief in a future state where good and evil will find their proper results? That is a motivating factor for our morality. With the consciousness of our immortality, we feel ourselves bound to right conduct. I mean, we're not being fitted for heaven now just to become ungodly when we get there. In Hebrews chapter 2, in the first three verses, the writer says, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken to us by the Lord? We cannot escape the sentence of death that's already against us if we neglect our salvation. The writer said here in chapter 10 and in verse 26 of Hebrews, what he's speaking about, he says, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. So we cannot neglect this great salvation that God has brought us. The hopes and the fears that are placed before us. We have hope in this great salvation. But we should have fear in neglecting it. And so, as the song Little Town of Bethlehem says, our hopes and fears through all the years. Life is full of hopes and fears. The great line of demarcation that separates the two great classes of society concerning morals has been drawn. On the one side, there are those who give heed to the conclusion of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. This says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter concerning life. Our duty is to fear God and to keep His commandments for God will bring every act to judgment, everything that is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. So these on this side of that great schism are ever conscious of their immortality and feel themselves bound to right conduct. However, on the other side, People are willingly ignorant and do not look beyond this present life. And their motto is, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. These are those who live their lives in desperate disregard of what Hebrews 9.27 tells us. That it is appointed unto a man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Unless their time of guilty pleasure should be shortened by repentance, they resolve to look away with indifference to the results, which is all the ethics of ignorance. We looked last week in Acts 17. Let's look there again. You know, if there were, if you could just pick out a few verses of Scripture that you could have, if you couldn't have them all, Acts 17 would be one of them I would choose. We'll look just to, today again to put ourselves in remembrance of verse 30 and 31. He says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, 
God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So these ethics of ignorance by which people choose to turn their face and not look at reality of judgment after death. So we ask, why then is the fundamental truth of repentance demanded? It's because immortality has been revealed. And that's what the Apostle Paul is speaking to us about here that a day of judgment has been appointed and the certainty of it is known to all who have received the pledges of God, the promises of God, going all the way back to Genesis 3.15. And they've examined the evidence that Paul lays before us here now that Christ has risen from the dead. However, man, for the most part, spends his days between fear and hope. And the days allotted to a man are 70, and if by strength, 80, or perhaps a little more. But it seems none with any length of time at all escape this life without some bitter experiences. And we learn that to some degree, life is full of trouble. Still, Life is a wonderful gift. We cling to it with desperate tenacity. We grip it. We don't want to let go of it. No matter how old or afflicted we may be, our desire is still for length of days. We don't want to let go of life. However, except the Lord first return, then we will all go the way of the earth. Like the flower of the grass, we shall all pass away. Our bodies will become food for the worms. And for many, death, that is dying, is a terrible trial to be endured. Now, if you turn to John chapter 12 and verse 24, we will consider the blessed consolation of the gospel. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains along. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. To use the apostles' analogy, the dead seed goes into the ground and lo, a beautiful plant springs up in its place. So with the Christian, our mortal bodies die and are mingled again with the clay from which they came. But through the quickening power of God by His Holy Spirit, there appears a new existence, a new immortal body, and we become heirs to glory, to honor, and eternal life. Lord willing, I'm going to come back to that in, our next, in my next lesson. And we will show the certainty of what the apostles said. The certainty of it. We'll look at that, God willing, in our next lesson. But now, there's more to be said about hope and fear. I read a book when I was quite young called The Pilgrim's Progress. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's a good depiction of the Christian walk as a walk of progression as we ascend the heights of Zion. Along the way, the heavenly traveler will come to perilous and dangerous distractions that will cause sorrow and moral deterioration such that would make angels shudder. Yet, the true child of God will survive them through repentance. 
I will mention three travelers that you are familiar with. In Luke 15, the first will be the prodigal son. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. His trial, this prodigal son, as we're going to see, his trial was with the lust of the flesh and all that the world had to offer. He said a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country and began to be impoverished. Trouble would come, as it does, especially when we turn back to the world. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Remember, Jesus is speaking to Jews here. And this was an abomination to them, these swine. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything to eat. So he's now enduring the pain of sin of the choices he made. But when he comes to his senses, and the true child of God will, even though his feet slip, he will eventually come to his senses. And he said, how many of my father's hired men have, have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Confession is always necessary when we have turned from the Lord, when we have brought shame and disgrace to his name to our household. Confession is always necessary. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. This is repentance. Willing to do works meet for repentance. So he got up and he came to his father, but while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He had brought harm to his father's name. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best rope and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. Just as we see in the scriptures that the angels celebrate over one sinner who repents. And so it is. Even the angels celebrate when one of God's children turn again. For this son of mine was dead. He was dead spiritually if he stayed in that condition. And has come to life again. He's resurrected again. He was lost and has been found. And they begin to celebrate. And so we see the Father's great mercy. The second traveler that we're going to look at is King David. 
We're all familiar with his sin concerning Bathsheba. And his trial was with the lust of his eyes. If you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and let's take this in. Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David rose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people and the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and a present from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat, to drink, and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called him, and he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his bed with his Lord's servants, but he did not go down to his house. Now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He had written in the letter saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. So it was as Joab kept watch on the city that he put Uriah at the place where he knew there were valid men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab and some of the people along uh, among David's servants fell. And Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and reported to David all the events of the war. He charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, and if it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck down Abimelech, the son of Jerushbeash, did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger departed and came and reported to David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field. But we pressed them as far as the entrance of the gate. Moreover, the archers shot at your servants from the wall. So some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to the Joab, did not, did not, or rather, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against the city stronger, and overthrow it, and so encourage him. Now when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. 
Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nourished, and it came up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and line his bosom, as was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold. Because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little... I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However... Because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. The scriptures say that David was a man after God's own heart. Wow. None of us are so protected from evil that we cannot fall. But God said, even though you've done harm, great harm to my name, given in place to the enemies to blaspheme, this great evil you have done, you have taken this man's wife and then you took his life. But God Knowing the heart of David, this truly was a child. And the child of God will always repent. The child will always turn again to the Lord, if he is a child indeed. And God knew his heart. And as he said, I've taken your sin from you and you will not die. But you're going to have trouble in your house all the days of your life. And you're going to lose this child. The third traveler that it will bring to your attention is the Apostle Peter. In his trial, in his trial was the pride of life. You see, Peter had said in Matthew 26, we'll just look at a few verses there. Uh, in Matthew 26, starting in verse 31. Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. 
Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the other disciples agree with Peter, Yes, Lord, no, we will die also for you. We know the story. Peter in verse 74 here of the same chapter. They're saying, are you not one of them? No, no, I'm not. Your speech betrays you. You certainly are one of them. Peter begins to curse and swear. He said, I do not know the man. Under such pressure at the moment. And immediately a rooster crowed. Peter remembered the word which Jesus has said. Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Jesus had told him that Satan had desired to have him to sift him as wheat. And so it happened. And so God had told Peter in Luke twenty two thirty two that when you turn again, meaning when you repent, and after your fall, you turn again, strengthen the brethren. And so Jesus told Peter in John 21, 17, three times, he asked him, after this had happened, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Three times he had to hear the Lord say it. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Now, these sojourners would experience fear. These travelers going to Zion and in their falling in their weakness under pressure they would experience fear and especially the fear of sinning because it's a fearful thing to sin these things they did would make angels shudder as they beheld it But they would experience also hope in their repentance because God's mercies are new every morning. So we'll close with one more example of hope and fear in the hearts of the disciples. Isaac Taylor was a man who lived back in the 1800s having departed from his body but now speaks to us. He says, the hour of hope and diffidence, that is, reserve, insecurity, uncertainty. No position of the human mind is more perplexing than the one it occupies when at the same moment the reasons of hope are indisputable and the, but the motives for despondency are overwhelming. At the same moment. The stress of this controversy of which we speak is between hope and fear. To understand the moment of which has been spoken, we must fix our eyes upon those dim hours of dismay to the scattered followers of Christ. The companions of the ministry of Jesus knew far too much of his divine power and his majesty to give up their profession of his messiahship. Even when it seemed utterly irrational any longer to maintain it. 
for their master instead of scattering with a word the mad hostility of his foes he had yielded he had been overcome he'd actually died on a cross and yet these simple minds slow of heart to believe and thus unmindful of the plan for them the forewarnings that they had received were now filled with shocking speculations they knew far too little of the future eventualities of that kingdom of heaven of which they were to be the ambassadors to put a true interpretation upon the sad events that they had witnessed Hope was overthrown. They had trusted that this Jesus was he who should have redeemed Israel. But how now indulge this belief while he laid as a mangled corpse in the tomb? And yet, how accept this hope was gone? When his majesty, his miracles, and speaking unlike any other man, were fresh in their recollections. And so it was in the hour of hope and uncertainty for three days. Then came Sunday morning. Let's stand and be dismissed.